Well, hello and welcome to this episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And here we are, Wes. It's time. It's time. You know, I feel like we've been on a roll lately Mm. with great conversations, you know, just really about some philosophy stuff. We had a conversation on the phone today. It was great. I mean, I yes, carried with it me was. all day long, by the way. That was just great. Yeah. I mean, quick shout out to Death of Expertise mm. by Nichols. Check Ordered. it out if you haven't read it. If you want to know why uh, the root of all of our problems right now in the world, <laughs> in the United States, and maybe dentistry as a start, mm. it's, uh, you know, do experts even matter anymore or do we all know everything? Because I was, you know, learned it on the YouTubes. I don't know. Facebook forums, Reddit. They're the experts. That's where they're at. That's where they live. Yeah, I don't trust those experts, man. What do they know? What do Mm. they do? They just went to school for a long time, wrote some books, textbooks. I mean, what makes us an expert? I'm not. See, that's the thing. I'm okay with that. That's right. I'm okay with saying, like, I'm still trying to get to that point in my career. Well, I don't ever want to call myself that. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you strive to become better and to feel like you have learned from people who are better than you. But in the end, you've still got to have somebody that you want to be like. Mm. You know, and I think that that's, that's a good point. Humility, humility is part of it. It's trying to to say, hey, I mean, the whole idea is the search. You know, it's the journey. It's the search. It's trying to figure out what's next, what's best, who's best at stuff, who knows more than I do, and sit there and take it. What what do they know? Like, what do you got for me? And be okay with the fact that we don't know. So it's kind of just disturbing sometimes when you think people are like, well, I, you know, I've been doing this a year, been doing this five years, so like, and I watched some videos, and so what is this person know who just because they've been doing it for this long what do they know oof maybe we talked about years ago on the show about changing Mm -hmm. and uh like dennis had this um for years this tendency uh to not be changers like they're just stuck Mm -hmm. doing the same things Mm -hmm. i mean honestly Mm -hmm. when whenever you know my dentist that I grew up going to in the 90s, fillings, a few crowns here and there, a lot of class six yep. amalgams, I'm sure. Um, never did a root canal, did a few partials, few dentures, you know, referred, did some extractions. He took out teeth because he traveled abroad and did some missionary dentistry, and so he felt comfortable taking out teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those those people, um, like that type of dentistry still exist. Sure. Today. And because change is it's difficult. It's difficult, and you don't want to be wrong. So, like, if you're questioning, well, what should I do? Is it the fear of, like, well, I don't even know how to get there? Like, I don't know where to start to look. Like, if I'm going to if I'm gonna embark on a new thing, and I want to do it the right way, mm-hmm. is it too much work to get there today? Like, is it not as easily obtained you know, when well, you, is it? And I think, and I think that it's never been easy to obtain. I think that's, I think that's the whole idea. Is it's never been, but I don't know that people think that as much. I think you know, I've gone through all these cycles of thought process on this conundrum, right? Because you can easily say, you know, somebody's. There's always this, okay, you've got a experienced group of people, maybe if it's just older people, and they kind of tend to look down on people who are newer just because you're like, well, you know, these people are doing it differently than I did. Mm. 
you know, and, and maybe that means they're, maybe they're doing it worse than I did, or there's perception of this or that just because they're different and difference doesn't necessarily mean worse, but there are limits to subjective judgment and objective judgment, right? There are subjectively things we can say, Hey, I don't like the way you do something that's subjective. I don't like maybe the way you learn is different than I learned, or maybe the way you get knowledge or the way you do implement even is different. But there is a difference between that, just saying, I don't like the way, I don't like the clothes you wear. Mm. And then saying about what are the actual outcomes? What are, what is what you're doing? Is it, is it actually good or bad? There is a black and white <clears throat> to you that. Know, my dad and served- I think that's, and I think that's the difference of saying it is. it has always been hard to change or implement or learn. That's never been easy. That's never changed. If anything, I think it's easier now to have access to the information mm-hmm. that could make it possible <clears throat> for you to implement something new or change something. It's easier to find information, but I think it's harder to find quality information. Yeah, I was going to say that the ease of access of information may be the mm, there may be a little smoke there that's disguising you know the quality yep and yep that's tough i i think when my dad you know my dad left you know when he was 18 and traveled the world um on a destroyer in the navy and was experiencing life in the Mediterranean and and war and mm-hmm. relationships and uh, learned systems and and methods and learned what uh, asking good questions how it, where it got you being an inquiring mm-hmm. mind um, not fear of um, the unknown like. Um, and that led, you know, even early on in my upbringing to um, good um, thought on processes. Him being yep. him being a self-made engineer. I mean, he really wasn't an engineer, but he was. So my dad went to drafting school, but then was mentored in the early seventies. And then he started his own business in the mid seventies and he had to have his papers signed by an actual certified engineer. But mm-hmm. in all intents and purposes, he was operating as an engineer and like any engineer that no, he never, like he would always, I can remember him taking papers cause he employed an engineer that had the degree. And the guy would always look at me when I worked for my dad and say, your dad's work is impeccable. I've never worked for anybody like, well, I've, he worked for my dad. So my dad had engineers working for him, even though my dad owned the business and my dad's doing a lot of the engineering. And so like my dad taught me how to, because my dad had to find out things. He had to learn things from experts like mm-hmm. geologists and things like that, where he <clears throat> was in the mining industry. He taught me how to look deeper beyond the superficial and not just accept one answer. So I can remember too, like bringing out books on architecture and whenever we were looking at different things and construction and projects that we would take it on ourselves. growing up in a very blue collar state, uh, you did a lot of things your own. Uh, you did it on your own and mm-hmm. you, you figured it out on your own and and that required, too, for him wanting to do it right, required for him to ask questions. And I remember going to the lumber company and sourcing lumber that had certain, you know, modulus of elas- elasticity. Mm. I mean, because we were looking at certain spans and we were looking at some modern building materials. So this type of thinking um, today, this type of um, question asking it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It really is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what we're struggling with the most potentially is, you know, are you asking questions of yourself? Mm. And I think that's the thing that, <clears throat> you know, we would find from this is first stop is asking 
why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and that is the key to success in any field that you are in, regardless is why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Do I know why? Intentional because it will lead you down a path that is very, <laughs> that is very dangerous in yeah. a good way yeah. because it will cause you to reevaluate mm. constantly and it will cause you to never be satisfied. But you know, there are things you can be satisfied by. Like you can get to a point where you can go, I think I'm currently doing the best version of this. But if you don't know why, if, 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 two questions in to the why you you're out of answers then it's time to, to dig deeper it's time to go deeper and i think as as dentists as doctors our goal is to become experts mm. our goal should be to become experts as hygienists as dental assistants as you know uh, financial coordinators treatment planning coordinators whoever it might be the goal is to become an expert or else i'm not saying everyone's goal is but i don't but those are my people those are my people. Those are the people that I enjoy being around. I don't mm. care what your expertise is even in. Be an expert in coffee, expert in wine, expert in flying, expert in, you know, digging ditches for, you know, irrigation. I don't care what it is. Just why do you do what you do and figuring out what the reason is and what's the best version of that. Or if not, I, I don't know what to tell you. And I think that's, the key towards starting down the path of deciding whether you want to be the best. And so, I don't know, yeah. the death of expertise, I don't know. It's worth reading. It'll challenge you. It'll get you thinking about hey, listen, why we do what we do. I'll tell you what, we're planning on a great uh, trip to meet some of the experts. At least we think we, they mm. are. Uh, they're way better than us, and they have always challenged us. But in 2025, are you planning your CE? Hey, it's the fourth mm. quarter. It's November, um, and um, man, it's start to t it's time to start planning. I mean, we were doing right. planning today, looking at our P and L for this <laughs> twelve month rolling period for next twelve month rolling period budgeting. You know, are we going to make more money next year? And if so, what's that going to do to variable costs and things like that? And then the next thing you know, you know, my manager looks at me and she says, "Well, how much CE are you taking this year?" Yeah, and so we have to start thinking about that. Well, guess what? We're going in 2025 to the 40th annual meeting of the Academy of Osseo Integration. I'm excited about it, John. And the Dental Guys has been asked to host again um, some amazing speakers and and create some amazing conversation surrounding. Um, just the experts in dentistry and what they're doing. John, tell us a little bit about some of the specialness about this year's coming meeting at the Academy of Osseo Integration. Well, I think the AO is pulling out the stops with this meeting on <clears throat> not only some of the names that will be there as some of the top speakers, including a keynote from Michael Norton, who if you've listened to the show you know who that is. <clears throat> you know how disruptive has been to, he has been to the industry in a very good way. And, <clears throat> you know, when you have somebody like Michael Norton as a keynote, you know the meeting is going to be challenging. And then we follow that up with some really awesome point-counterpoint uh, discussions on issues that are really, really relevant, no matter whether you are a brand-new clinician or very, very experienced clinician. And, uh, you know, we've got some some just top names discussing pros and cons of some issues that are really serious. Plus, the AAP and AO consensus uh, conference discussing mm. perimplantitis and really what should we, what do we really know and how do we treat it? They're going to be presenting their conclusions uh, and recommendations from both academies, which is major, to help to sort of settle in on what, what do we right now know and what can we right now do to be able to prevent and treat peri-implant disease? Mm -hmm. So that's just a little preview, let, let alone lunch with the masters featuring some of the best in the industry, let alone, you know, the, the always amazing reception. And the fact that it's in Seattle, one of my favorite cities, a super fun place to be, full of very, very passionate people in great dentistry, always this meeting brings it. And I think this year it's going to be, you know, 
as big or bigger than ever. So if you don't have, if you've not heard about this meeting, go over to osseo.org and check it out, osseo.org. And this is something that I think could be a game changer for you, whether you're starting off in implant dentistry or whether you're very experienced, you're going to truly hear from people that will make you better. And mm -hmm. so, so check it out, osseo.org, the AO 2025 meeting. And before we get into a little bit more of the meat of the show, Wes, let's give some love mm. to those who make it possible for us to produce this show. Now, how about the Dental Crafters Network? Unlock the potential, John, of one relationship with the Dental Crafters Network. John and I were having a conversation about a particular high-level person today at the Dental Crafters Network who's been a technician there since she was like 18 or 19 and it's 20 some years of experience. Um, and I was having some very high level conversations with this young lady, um, about occlusion and her recent, uh, education with Kevin Quishan. You all know we're big fans of Kevin, but this is just the type of things that help the dental crafters network really help you because this is where possible, possibilities are truly infinite. Family-owned, full-service dental laboratory. They collaborate closely with dentists, just like I was talking about, to understand the unique needs of your patients and then also meeting this ever-changing dental industry. Uh, intra or camera technology, how do we use it? All those things we hear us talk about. Choose the Dental Crafters Network where your vision meets innovation. Visit dentalcrafters.net or call 1-800-472-8302. And don't forget to mention the dental guys and get 10% off your first case. And also brought to you by Restorative Driven Implants. And, you know, implant dentistry, obviously, we were talking about this early show, implementing things is challenging. And dental implants are certainly one of those things that many people, I think, pause and go, man, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for that. And, you know, we do believe that there are ways to, to implement this that, that really are successful. And restorative driven implants as a continuum, which both Wes and I have been involved with over the years and helped to kind of develop some of the curriculum. Um, restorative driven implants is doing it right. Uh, many implant continuums out there are just offering for you to come in, some patient that, you know, really hasn't had much treatment planning, isn't really real world and place one of 10 implants into a full arch, something you might not re routinely do in a typical restorative dental practice. But restorative driven impl drin implants is real. It is real cases. It is real research-based education. It is real surgical experience on, on patients that you would find in your actual practice with CTs, with guides, with, you know, actual restorative game plans. It's the way implants should be taught. And it's extremely rare to find a continuum that actually respects not only the data and the research, but also creates an environment that you feel like when you finish this continuum, you can be ready to implement dental implants into your practice, both surgically and restoratively. And you can take it as far as you want with restorative driven implants. You can do basics. You can do basic surgery, basic restorative, all the way up to very advanced things because they have a whole pathway you can follow that has been vetted to, to create uh, clinicians that are confident in their skills. So if you're thinking about that being your next step in your practice, I would urge you to visit restorativedrivenimplants.com or to call 715 715- 207-6587. That's 715-207-6587. Make sure that you mentioned the dental guys, that we were the ones that sent you. Restorative Driven Implants, thanks for being a longtime sponsor of the dental guys. And, and Wes, I think that's a great segue into this discussion. Absolutely. Because after just talking to you about restorative driven implants, and even the title, even the words that are in that, title or it's all about being restorative driven and so it what's interesting is sometimes Wes the more that you know about a topic and if you haven't ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect oh you should look it up 
Dunning Kruger, it's a curve. It's very interesting. Essentially, it's graphing on the x axis the amount of uh, experience that you have, and on the y axis the amount of confidence that you have. And when we all start off, we know we don't know. And then somebody puts a tool in our hands, right? So, like maybe we get a little experience, and maybe somebody puts a tool in our hands, and they go, hey, this is an implant. And maybe you put an implant in to some bone, and you go, hey, I, I, I think I can do this. I'm pretty good. So you get a little experience and you get very overconfident. Mm. And the more that we know about all the things that we know, I think the more that Wes and I, we have learned along with many of you that when you go through the process of learning and you go through the process of, of discussing, especially if you want to try to treat cases well to where you're not having a continuous flow of emergencies in your practice, you have to start thinking about the big picture. Mm. And sometimes you have to take that tool, that hammer that's in your hand, whether it be an implant, a crown, whatever it is, and you have to put it down and you have to say, not today. Today is not the day for same day dentistry. Today is not the day to treatment plan, a bridge, a crown. Today's not the day to put in that immediate implant. And why do we think like that? Mm. Why is it that Wes and I have actually, as we progress through our careers, through our journeys, why do we have days? I mean, you just imagine, imagine this, this patient comes into your practice with, you know, let's say you've got implants as a tool. Let's say you've taken restorative driven implants or another great implant continuum. You feel very comfortable with placing implants. Patient comes in, tooth number five, tooth number four. Let's make it even less aesthetic. Tooth number four, tooth number 20, fractured at the gingival margin. Mm. And there's no infection. It's a clean break, endodontically treated. And it's fractured, and you're looking at this, you're going, man, I wouldn't even have to pull out my drills. I could just take this tooth out, curette the socket, and I could just I could just drop an implant perfectly, beautifully into that. I looked at my CT, the bone's perfect. I'm nowhere near any anatomy. Yeah. It's straight root. Mm. There's no problems with the teeth next door. I mean, you all know if you've if you've placed implants or if you've seen people place implants that are good, it's it's usually a less than thirty minute exercise from the time you 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 pull out the needle to anesthetize the patient to the time they're heading out the door for this immediate implant on number four or number twenty. So why is it that we've just got to stop doing that? Why is it that that what what would cause me and Wes to stay to say whoa? This is not the time for that because I want to tell you that when surgeons get referral letters from a lot of us restorative dentists, you know what it says? Implant number four. <laughs> Implant number twenty. Nothing else. And I mean, that is what is the case. I mean, I teach all around the country. Wes does too. And we talk to groups. Usually when I'm teaching, many times it's for a surgeon mm -hmm. who has a bunch of restorative referrals and the surgeon is trying to get the referrals to up their game. So they're like, all right, we want our referrals to be able to do a better job at understanding what they should be doing. And the number one thing that I hear, then literally the number one across the board is, I get from these doctors implant number four. And when I go in there and I look, and these are surgeons who should not really know much or really don't have the responsibility of treatment planning, and they look at these cases and they're like, "There's, this is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. This whole person's mouth, maybe they have 20 other giant cavities. They have uncontrolled perio. They have multiple other broken teeth. 
And their job today is to put in an implant at number four. And Wes, I want you to talk through a little bit about why especially with implant dentistry, is this something we really have to be thinking about from the get-go? And, and wh why is it so important? My thought process on um, pulling the trigger um, is a little more calculated now than even it was maybe even 18 months ago. And it really has to do with the knowledge of experience, yes, plays a role in seeing your own stuff. But also, um, I think we all, John and I have put ourselves around enough people to where it's they've asked us questions that made us think. And it's made me think a little bit more about some things. Let's talk about those things. So the very first thing that would make me concerned about moving forward with implant therapy with a patient is um, age. And I just want to I want to talk about that a little bit for a minute here. And a lot of patients um, will show up in your office and let's move beyond the number four and let's move into the young female or the young male that's congenitally missing laterals. They're, they, most likely they've um, had braces or they're in braces and you get the letter from the orthodontist and it's all about like, just let me know, doc, when everything's in the right place. And they say for the dental implant and the mom comes in thinking dental implants. Now, this has happened probably six times this year. And um, this is where I'm stopping. And it's not because the patients don't have bone, because a lot of them do have bone, and a lot of them could have bone built. In fact, most of them could have the space. They just need maybe ridge augs and things like that. But is it the right thing to do? So age has definitely played a role. And I'll tell you what really changed my mind when it comes to adolescent implants in the anterior and even really implants less than... The other day we had this conversation, probably less than 45. In the right bite, the option to do something more conservative most of the time is available. And I'm not talking about bridges. I'm talking about Maryland bridges here. I'm not talking about cutting down two adjacent teeth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about virgin teeth. I'm not talking, you know, and sometimes maybe a bridge is a better option than an implant. Because if we do look at the literature on fixed partial dentures in cases that are set up correctly, the success rate for the bridge is incredible. It's incredible. We all see these mm. people coming in that have fixed partial dentures that are incredible. So I worry, actually I don't worry, I know that there will be facial changes. In fact, we know, and this is going to be a mind-boggling statement, there is as much facial changes going on, John, correct me if I'm wrong, between the ages of 12 and 21 as there is between 35 and 55. Yep. It's a major and time. It's a it's it's like what? So there's a stopping point between 21 and the mid 30s and then we have some facial growth happening in the mid face and it tends to be a downward and back. So the maxilla moves down and it retracts. And how do we know these things? Well, we know these things now because we're able to with technology be able to put a ton of data points in with skulls and things like that and actually predict <clears throat> what people's faces are doing. So therefore, it's like, whoa, 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 what does that mean for dental implants? Well, in the posterior, it doesn't mean much, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it means 
a new restoration, occlusal adjustment, an open contact, an open potentially. contact, something like that. In the anterior, in the in the in the, in certain situations, it could mean total rehab. Like we're talking like complete rehab, deconstructing the whole thing back to ground zero. Most of the probably fifty percent of the time, at least, means redoing the restoration and now a longer tooth. But it also means that we're going to be exposing threads out the buccal plate. Now we might not be exposing them through soft tissue, but we may be we may be seeing grayness at the soft tissue line, which is very difficult to mask. Both John and I took Pat Allen, one of the best grafters, of and using using very impressive techniques with alloderm and watching him tunnel around implants scarred areas incredible results but still yet he'll tell you one of the hardest procedures and rehabs that they do is to try to mask some of this so where i say no right now is i'm saying no more often in the not always in the anterior with young people uh, mostly less than 40 45 ish um, I'm getting more, more, I'm leaning more towards other restorative options. Let's just say that it's a conversation. Yes, and I stopper. think that that is, I think that's exactly, that is a conversation stopper. That's a big change in thought big process. Time. And it's all coming back to just what, <clears throat> you know, what changes in the face. And I think that's been something that's been a huge topic of conversation on the show, both with, facial development and what can we do to influence facial development because let's let's also make that just one deeper step Wes that how many of those 17 year olds actually has the teeth and the bone in the right place yeah when I'd they're say, when I'd... they are that age let alone yeah. what will happen with development from age 17 to 45 mm-hmm how many of them actually have had intervention that actually gets them to a healthy place with their face at a younger age? We know from an anthropological standpoint that over the last thousand years, our jaws are getting smaller, mm -hmm. and especially in Caucasians. So what are, are, we, are we actually thinking about that? Because when we start to place implants in these patients that are younger, that you know had four by extraction case situations or had no intervention early on a transverse discrepancy or an AP problem, mm. and now we're locking them into an implant, it, is that the right treatment? And is the reason why sometimes we see this instability? This is the next level. This is what people don't even know the answer to yet. Why are, is it is it the, is the fact that we see the instability of these cases because of just implant therapy and growth, or is it because we didn't actually have facial bony structure wow. in the right place from the beginning? It, are we seeing issues with how muscles are trying to, you know, uh, keep us alive? For the next 15 years because we didn't actually have the you know the bones and jaw in the same place in other words could we have stability the big question is why do people why do why do we have ortho relapse yeah i think the thing right that is it all connected here, to the same discussion that we're having is like why is it some people don't relapse when they forget well, to wear the retainers yeah and so, why is it that some people do john you're hitting on some good stuff Dental alveolar compensation. It's a word that we don't really talk about uh, very often. It's a word that honestly wasn't a part of my vocabulary probably until the last three to five years. Um, and defining that is your body, your teeth, despite variations in your skeleton, will compensate Okay, and two, what can happen is that we can camouflage really a skeletal issue with straight teeth. And so I think if you put implants in an area where there has been compensation and you've not, you don't have the diagnostics to effectively evaluate that, let's say you're a non-placer. Let's just say you're a restoring doc. And you get the note 
from your patient that's in their mid-20s. She just came out of college. She's able to afford to be able to do this. And you put her in braces and teeth are straight. But then you miss it. And there is a small mid-face already. But, and you don't have a CT scan or you're just not able to diagnose these type of things Mm -hmm. and you, you check off, do it. You're ready. I've got seven millimeters, you know, the perfect central, Mm -hmm. the perfect lateral, let's say, you know, space. And you send her to the surgeon. And the next thing you know, is the implant ends up back, you restore it and you practice for 10, 15, 20 years. And over the time you're like, Something's changing here. You know, it's not overnight. But you're like, ah, it's the connection. We're getting a little mm-hmm. bit of inflammation here or something's not right. We didn't sink that implant deep enough. You know, you start thinking, why is this happening? What is going on here? And I, and I, this is where I really pause a minute now with dental implants, the anterior. Um, I'm also offering patients... Um, in their younger years, uh, more apicos um, on anteriors. I have someone here mm. locally doing that on restorable teeth. Um, we're also doing forced eruption now, mm-hmm. um, just like Frank has showed over the years. And because we want to preserve teeth and preserve papilla. Um, if you look at what even you know, what we're trying to do to save Papilla, what Dennis is doing, Dennis Tarnow, and then people that like, uh, that teach um, Howie, or what's his name? Um, yeah, Gluckman. Yeah, Howie Gluckman <clears throat> is doing some amazing things now with Socket Shield and how they're doing three-dimensional Papilla shapes, kind of carving the the remaining two structure. I mean, it's amazing what can be done, but is also very complicated if things don't go right. And so well, I think- and I want to just I want to even just go back a level or two, right? Because <clears throat> what we're talking about is really challenging you if you've been in the mindset of just you know, hey, you know, congenitally missing laterals. Yeah, we wait for growth, quote growth to complete, and we place the implant. <clears throat> Not saying it's always bad treatment. Mm-hmm. I think there's 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 a lot of variables here that are clinical decision making. Mm -hmm. But I think even just taking it up a few levels to to where we're not deep diving as much. How many of these cases that show up at the oral surgeon's office with implant number four on the prescription, is that the, is everything else where it needs to be? Yeah. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about decay, rampant decay that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's make it, let's just make it simple. And so forget let's, about let's development and growth. Yeah. How, how about the next thing? Patient sits down in your chair, emergency visit, number four is broken off. You're like, Dad gum, dude, let's just throw an implant in there. But then what you fail to do is you fail to look at three and five and six and the opposing. Mm. You're not you don't have enough pause to even just think. Whoa, whoa, what is going on here? Is there an occlusal disease that's active that we're breaking teeth? Because let's just put something in stronger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if this patient has had multiple restorations, we're not just talking about the single tooth that breaks off that had the just out of the way root canal and none of the other teeth are restored. That's not this patient. This patient you sat down in has been a patient that has paid your daughter's college with broken teeth. Right. And they come in and you're just like, uh, and they say, whatever you need. Hey, doc, you've been, hey, whatever. It's been broke. You, you know, we can't, oh, we can't save it. Sure enough. Put an implant in. Yep. Your assistant just said, put it in. Put it in. I already got me the treatment plan right here. They're just so efficient here. I love you, doc. Love your whole team. Numb it up right now. Take it out. Put it in. We all have these patients. And you're like, sure, let's do it. We got an opening same-day service implant, man. I mean, that's the greatest day. 
But then, so, but here, here I tell you what: in the past ten years, I've taken a pause. Mm. I've, been pl- I've been placing implants for twenty-one years, John. I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm yeah. taking a pause. I'm taking a pause in the last ten years, and I'm saying, "Wait a minute, have you? Let's just stop for just a second here, yep, and just." think about stuff and not just let's put the nail and the hammer down and let's diagnose like and let's look at this from a holistic standpoint and stop getting caught up in the rush of your dental office Mm. i think another thing that i the other day i saw a patient john that was very interesting to me she comes in and she says i want implants I'm ready for it. I've, I, 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 I'm ready. And I'm like, sweet, let's go. I mean, like, tell me your story. We go through a whole story in my consultation area. She hadn't been to the dentist in five years, but mm. she had been a dental patient her entire life. Yep. And she's just returning after some things, and life has settled enough to take care of her. And she has the means. Mm-hmm. And And I'm like, <clears throat> looking and I'm thinking she has the bone but then I'm thinking what is going to happen here because yep. here's a person that has some significant diseases and I asked her I was like how's your health <laughs> well it's better what's your A1C well been about nine, Doc. You know, what have they been t- treating you for? And you're just like, hmm, interesting, myriad. And like, you're yep. looking at your CT right now, John, and you're thinking, man, this is dream town. Like, this is take the teeth out. This is just level the bone and just go. You know, hmm. like, we've been trained to do this. We've got the nail and the hammer ready to go. And everybody is like, this is perfect, Doc. This is perfect. Everybody knows because they see the CT in your office. Your associate's walking by and he's like, perfect case for full arch. And then you pull up the photos and your associate goes, oh, because he's been trained to stop. And he's like, whoa, look at the hygiene on that one. Yep. Look, what's the A1C? And and you look and you're like, eight. And they were like, Better get that under control. Yeah, and this is where I mean I know that this seems like it's it's so it's this this is is not what's on Instagram, John. No, exactly. Ever it's it's not what you're gonna get at at Clear Choice. No, I shouldn't say that. Some (laughs) some of them are better than others. Some of them are. But you know when all you have is a hammer, and then everything's a nail and. When we start putting tools in our hands, whether that tool is as complicated as a full arch zirconia restoration mm. or a hybrid or it's a it's a denture, it's a crown, it's a composite, I don't care what it is. And all we start looking at is this thing in a vacuum and we go, hey, this this is an implant candidate. This tooth is an implant candidate. This mm. tooth is a crown candidate. Whatever it is. And we stop looking at why did the patient end up in this situation? Mm-hmm. Then we start, what we start doing, and you might be thinking, stop stop telling me not to do dentistry. <laughs> no, what I'm telling you is, it's really going to be, this is really true. This is really, really, really true. It's all about what you want your practice to look like in five years. Yep. Because if you treat that patient without stopping and stopping, just for a moment, pausing and thinking about risk factors and how they got there to this point. And if you don't know the answer to how they got there, it's time to go take some more CE. Mm. But, you know, asking yourself, how did they get here? Why does this keep happening? But if you don't ask that question and you just do that crown or you just place that implant or whatever it is, in, in five years, I promise you, your practice will be made up of people are coming in with increasingly more difficult problems to fix and you have then built yourself 
you've painted yourself into a corner because once you do have an implant at number four and every other tooth from, from five to 13 is super erupted four millimeters further down than it was, than it was, or they, they have no posterior support and you just put in that one implant or that one crown on the lower left because they broke the mesiobuccal cusp. And now they start coming in with the next tooth broken and mm -hmm. the next thing broken. And now, oh, your implant crown's loose. Or you've got a, a you know an abscess on this other tooth. And now that takes the implant with it because you know there was an endo problem on the tooth next door. And you've got this is where you start. I talk to a lot of not, you know what? It's not newer grads. No, it's not. It's so it's everybody. Let it's me across just, the board. Yeah, it's just what people who are like, here? you know, you got, I just, I don't know. I mean, if you, I go into these practices sometimes when I, I'm in some of these other cities and I'm with these surgeons and they're like, yeah, come visit, come visit our, our office. And I come to these offices and I'm just there for like, literally it's just a social event. Most of the time they, they just want to like talk. They just want to like shoot the crap. So I go in there and I look at their schedules. <laughs> and I mean, I got emergencies. I'm not saying that at all. But what I will make the statement and I think and I think if my associate or my <laughs> my my practice manager was was on here right now, I could raise my right hand and I could say this is the truth. 90% of the emergencies I have are things the patient knew was going to happen. And I'm not saying all. I'm saying 90% of the emergencies are but things see, that's the patient what you knew want. was going to happen. That's what you want. I, I, I use this as an example. Years ago, I was taught, we know that we've had Darren Deister on the show and other prosthodontists and ourselves included. We've been trained by people that taught us about the maxilla and overdentures. And I have, I'm not going to tell you what I do because it, we would have to go into the high weeds, but I have a particular way of treating the maxilla and I have a certain set of treatment plans for a removable overdenture. Okay. Now I have a design that I was taught that was backed by science and backed by cases mm -hmm. and practicality and, and, and it makes sense engineering and Whenever you look at that design, you, you, you would think, oh, man, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to do that. Why would you do that? Well, I was, I asked those questions. And, but then when I asked the laboratory about this design and they say, how are you doing that? Or why are you doing that? Because we do see failures and you don't, do you have failures? And I'm like, no, I don't have failures with this. I don't see implant failures with this, and here's why, and here's the literature. Can you teach some of our doctors why that's not happening? Well, sure. Sure, I'd be glad to share the information and what was taught to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not the expert, but I am the person using experts' opinions and experts' uh, case studies and experts' studies and literature to back up what I'm doing, and it's proving to be true. It's the same thing, too. Like, I recently listened, uh, looked up the success rate of removable partial dentures, and it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's like less than 50% in the maxilla, and I think it's like less than 30% in the mandible. And I'm like, I go to my manager and my assistant and I'm like asking, I was like, what? And my hygienist who's cleaning this stuff, I'm like, what do you think the success rate of my partials are? It's like, like I mean, I really feel like, are we doing a good job here? Because I'm seeing this stuff that's telling me they aren't successful. And the, the more of the story is, is that these the, you have to build a practice built on a certain thing that you want to see happen down the road, like John is saying. And so if I want to treat to disease, if I want to curb my treatment plans to people's diseases and their people's wants, and you succumb to being a 
I'm going to do what the patient wants every single time. I'm not going to have conflict. I'm not going to stand up for the certain amount of principle in treatment planning. If you do that, then what will happen is five years from now and 10 years from now, if you're in that same practice, is that you will turn into, oh my gosh, it's another one of those. Oh my goodness, what do I do now? And especially with dental implants, John, because the revisions are terrible, Mm -hmm. are terrible. terrible. Well, and I think too, you've got to think about how hard it is to talk to a patient after the third or fourth root root canal and crown it's embarrassing. And then there's another fifth and sixth. And maybe the crown you did on year one now has recurrent decay that you did the root canal and crown on on year one in a rampant caries risk patient and you didn't address. I'm just talking basics here. Not even, it doesn't have to be crazy stuff. Just not addressing caries risk. Not not talking about what causes a cavity and just mm-hmm. treating stuff. And then, yeah. you know, I, I, ha, I, I mean, these people who come in and you've, you've done... 10 crowns over three or four years and then the first crown you did has recurrent decay and you're like oh no what am i going to do because i never really talked through with this patient what was going to happen with if we didn't change this i just i looked at it and the patient's like we do i need a crown yes you do you just do it and all of a sudden you get into the situation where it's so much harder to sit the patient down as if they're a new patient and say, you know what? Everything we've done up till now, I did it in good faith, but I, we might be heading the wrong direction. That's mm. a tough conversation. It takes like every bit of goodwill that you have with the patient versus on day one saying, you know, rather than just dive into this crown, I'm going to say, you might not be a good candidate for crowns. I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm saying you might not be a great candidate for have you crowns. Ever, and have you what ever will said that this? look like? Have you ever said this in the beginning of your practice or sat down with a patient and they said, well, Doc, can you just try to fill that tooth? Like, just, just try because the other docs filled it a couple times. Can't you just try to? And... You build a practice built on feels Mm. versus like, wait, no, we can't. And here's why. And this, and you're confident, like you don't him haul around about it. I love, I mean, that, that's, that means you don't, you're not wishy washy on it. You walk in the room and you have a photo of the tooth and you know that this is, recurrent decay the sixth time and you're like it's not me it's you Mm -hmm. and something has to change and i'm really concerned about it and you say it with every bit of like caring and confidence and that's what people want in the doctor they don't want oh yeah you're right you've probably been just drinking too many cokes and we can just refill yep. that. Yeah, it's a little big, and if it breaks, we'll crown it whenever it breaks. And then you build a practice built on crown on teeth that break all the time. Yeah, and you <laughs> might think <laughs> that that's and, and at first, at first, that seems first of all because you might not have the confidence to think comprehensively, which we don't blame you for. As we as we talked about before, we don't expect you if you listen to the last episode. You didn't get taught to treatment plan in dental school. So stop thinking you did because you didn't. All you got, all you hopefully got maybe Mm. is what to do with the single tooth, making a call, making a call on a single tooth, restorable or not, what type of restoration, what needs to happen. Not necessarily that you could do it all, but that you knew what options a single tooth has and whether or not it's got a good prognosis, a poor prognosis, what have you. But you didn't get, you did not get taught to treatment plan. So if you don't know what to do, that's okay. We're saying that should lead you down a path toward pursuing uh, a treatment planning continuum. 
learn how to think about this, learn where teeth need to go, learn how to think through these cases. I'm not expecting you to know, but what I'm saying is if you don't know, and so your default is just to go, you know what, let's just get out of this conversation as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say, you know what, I think I can probably get a composite in there. You know what, I think I can, I think we can try a filling. You know, you might get a little bit of time out of that. And then that sounds good and it might please the patient at first. But what will start to happen is the patient's not owning the decision. Mm. They're not owning the problem. You're not presenting the best case options and letting the patient say no to the best. So now it's your problem. Now it's your composite. Now it's your problem. And when the patient calls you and they say, well, he did this, comp he did this filling like three months ago and now it's broken, you're going to fill this pit in your stomach and you're going to start doing free dentistry. You're yeah. going to start giving stuff away. You're going to start doing redos. It's going to create a slippery slope. I know a lot of you are in this right now and you're trying to figure out how to dig out of it. And it's a whole much more difficult thing to dig out of. So just be starting to think differently on if tomorrow when that denture patient comes in, this is a low hanging fruit. I'll give you the low hanging fruit because my associate and I've talked about this a million times. When that denture patient comes in, or what a potential denture patient, and it's a lower denture, mm. just think about it in the most basic way. If you say to this patient, you know what? Yeah, we'll do we'll we'll do the best we can and make you a lower denture. <laughs> we'll make you the best lower denture we can. And you know what? Some people they do okay with that. And you know, I'll do everything I can to make it work for you. Here comes some sage advice. Think of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then when you make the denture and it doesn't work, it's not comfortable, it doesn't do whatever they think it's going to do, whatever that looks like, whose fault is that? Oh, you man. feel a sense of ownership versus, okay, totally different conversation. Well, you know what, patient? Let me talk to you about what I would do if this was my wife, my mom, my brother, my best friend. I would do this option. Maybe that's a fixed hybrid. Maybe that's crown and bridge on implants. Maybe it's locators, whatever so, it is. You present a couple options. It starts like that, John. Well, how it starts is the patient sits down in the chair and the assistant comes out after a, maybe an initial interview or the hygienist and they always say, yeah, they got no money. They only want what insurance wants. And then immediately, immediately, this is where you guys are going wrong and where I went wrong and where John went wrong for so mm -hmm. many years immediately you change your treatment plan. Well, That's I, right. I don't have time for that. Just treatment plan a denture, take out their teeth, alveoloplasty. Right. Like you don't you even don't, talk about it. You don't even And then what ends up happening with these two options is as I've told my my great associate doc who's like su such a great clinician is the conversation is beautiful. Yes. When you have a patient who says, "You know what? Thank you." for presenting those options to me. Yes. I can't afford them, or I think it's not maybe worth it, or that's ridiculous amount of money, Yeah. or my, my grandma did fine with regular dentures, yeah. or I, I'm going to start with a uh, regular denture and maybe I'll do those implants down the road, or, you know, I got it, my car broke down, I got to do, okay. I'm like, that's totally fine. When the denture sucks, the conversation is beautiful. They either... Don't complain <laughs> or when they come in there and they've been in for their third adjustment and you kind of sit down and I get this kind of look with them. I'm like, kind of like a little nod. I'm like, so, I mean, heard it's not going. I good. don't, I don't think this is getting better. I don't know that I can make it any better than it is. And the patient kind of looks at you and they kind of give you the same look and they're like, yeah, I kind of knew, I kind of, I kind of probably should have gone the other direction. You know what? They may still not be able to do it and that is fine. And I just reassure them and I say, you know what? If that day comes, I'll be here. We can still go that route. But yep. until then, I, I'm just, I told you from the beginning I really don't know that I can do much better than what you have now. And all of a sudden, instead of it being 23 adjustments that you do, you do three and the patient goes, I think I'm going to do my best to live with this. Or mm -hmm. I'm going to go the right, let's try those locators. And magically, 
not always, but magically, all of a sudden, they've got the money to do implants. It happens all, all the, the time. time. All Here's the time. The thing, and my know, schedule is not full of those difficult decisions mm -hmm. or those difficult discussions because I didn't have the foresight to talk about what's possible and give my patients the opportunity to say no and open me up for it not to be my problem, my denture. It's no longer my denture, it's their denture. No joke. Whenever my current associate joined our practice, he was like, so what about emergencies on the weekends? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, who handles that stuff? And I kind of gave him our protocol and he was like, well, how often are you coming in? And I was like, I don't know. I kind of looked at my manager. I was like, when was the last time we had to come in on the weekend? She was like, well, Kylie came in and like, did this little recement of like somebody's anterior temporary, you know, that they were going out of town and she wanted him, she wanted to do it because she knew it was kind of a VIP. And I was like, okay, like when, what are we dealing with on the weekends? And I looked at yep. her and she was like, she looked at the associate and she's like, we really don't have problems. And I'm not, yep. hey, listen, I'm just telling you. In 20 years of practice, it's about building for what you're going to do later on. Now, you mm -hmm. might be ready <laughs> to, to just jet out of your practice now, so it doesn't even matter. <laughs> you right. Know? But I tell you what, is uh, this, this kind of thing is interesting because it'll change your mind on a lot of things. There are points, and, and there are a lot more points to be made about individual circumstances. I can think of John and I have protocols on when a tooth is deemed non-restorable. At what point do we take a tooth out and place an implant? I mean, we can go in to very uh, intricate, like individual circumstances, but it does mm -hmm. get multifactorial. It does, there are a lot of variables involved and your diagnosis actually gets to be more refined the, the more adept you become at actually seeing disease processes. And I agree with John. I think the first step, and we've been talking about this this year a lot, is, is going to a great treatment planning course, learning more about treatment planning, and actually not just that, putting yourself around people that are asking questions. We mm -hmm. talked about that at the beginning of the show, and we'll kind of come back to this at the end of the show. It, you have to learn how to ask questions about your own stuff. You have to be ready to kind of say, okay, I'm wrong. So for today, what am I doing now? Like for instance, um, we are actually looking at how we're collecting data mm -hmm. from the new patient. And I, I felt like I was collecting too much data. It wasn't very intentional. And so myself and my chair side assistant were actually redoing my exam form. And, you know, it's a very tough thing for me because I'm going to throw away some th some stuff and I, she challenged me on it and she's like we're never looking at that stuff that doesn't mm. do us any good it doesn't help us with this because we have it here we can look at it here you don't need to put it there as well and so it's a very challenging thing whenever you start questioning what you're doing and yep. it begins to make you feel like you're not a good dentist, you know, yep. you're going to feel like, Hey, I'm just a, not a good dentist. We'll just get out of your hole. Right. There's an answer and it's, and it's easy. Yep. You just accept it and you start to move forward and you find great dentist and you find people that will answer your questions. It could be the dentist that's working with you. It yep. could be the dentist that's across the town. It could be at some kind of study club. But you find people that are willing to listen to you and ask and for you to cry on their shoulder and say, I, I had this happen to me. Can you tell me why it happened? And they're not so – they're – this the type of people that I try to go to whenever I when I started dentistry that I had this happen why did this happen tell me what can I do different 
and and I'm like, I'm not afraid for you to tell me that I did something wrong. I just go ahead and say it up front. Just tell me what I did wrong. I want to do it better. I don't care if I'm wrong. I'm going to make it right, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you approach someone that you respect that's maybe been in this position before, that's the first step of getting better. And, and yeah, not, and I think we just have to be open to trying these things. You know, yes. I think that that's, you know, yes. what we would maybe encourage you to do, <clears throat> you know, is tomorrow or next week in your practice to, you know, maybe have a sit down discussion with somebody you practice that you trust, whether it be a manager, whether it be another doctor, whether it be, you know, an assistant, a hygienist, mm -hmm. somebody that you know is trying to do a really great job and just say, hey, you know, I'm kind of, I'm looking at what we're struggling with the most or maybe what makes me feel the most burnout or the most mm. stressed, the thing that's destroying our schedule the most often. What doesn't And I can joy. pretty much yeah. guarantee you that it's something that has to do with what we're talking about most of the time, mm -hmm. most of the time. The things at least that are preventable, right? Because there's things that aren't preventable. We understand that. And maybe see, just start having, just try it. Have a different discussion on Monday morning with that patient that comes in with that broken tooth. Have a discussion that is more open-ended. Have a discussion that's more about, are we, you know, what's possible? What should we be thinking about? How did we get here? Why are we seeing this? And, and, and if you start having that, I can promise you that within a year, two years, five years, literally transform your practice. You will be having more fun. Mm -hmm. You'll feel more accomplished, and it'll also lead you down the right roads toward continuing education. Because if you don't know why someone keeps having a problem, man, there's answers for that. Yeah, and there, and that's what we're here to kind of say. We've only been, we only say this because we've been there, and we've done it, and we've seen it, and we messed it up, and we all of a sudden went, okay, I know there's more out there, so let's figure out what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge to you as we sort of close out this show is just. You know, you have the power to change this. If you feel like this is something that you want in your practice, we can do better than implant number four. You know, we can. We can do better than implant number four, and we can literally find a way to know why people are where they are right now and then change it all. So I think, Wes, this is, this is where... I, I, I don't know. Of the last couple of shows, we've done a lot of discussion more about just kind of philosophy of communication and talking to patients. I and mean, honestly, in some ways, it's much, much, much more important than actually what you know how to do. It's not really about that. I, I really don't care if someone refers everything, almost everything out. Well, that's, see, that's the full circle conversation. The dentist I grew up in, he didn't do all this stuff. The daggum. Yeah, man. the actual procedures weren't the wasn't the key. He didn't. He didn't. wasn't the key. The key to his success was just he could communicate. I can tell you probably five people that I knew that he had referred for um, orthognathic surgery. You know, and I'm like, I'm thinking mm -hmm. back on that, and I was like back in the late '80s, early '90s. Mm. I can think of people that he saw that needed specialized root canal therapy and he had him drive an hour away to have it done. I can think about the conversations he had with me about my oral hygiene. And he was a good communicator. Mm. And I think that, John, as we kind of close out the show here is in the last couple of shows, we've been really talking about communication. And it's 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 the hallmark of uh, really being taking the next step into really creating the, an environment um, where you can really have ultimate happiness and joy is learning how mm. to communicate, not only with your team, but with your patients. And it seems see, so cliche, um, but we truly believe that. John, close out the show for us tonight. Yeah, I, I hopefully these discussions we're having are impactful uh i know that when people had these discussions with us years ago it really changed the way we thought and and really i think led to us being more fulfilled and, and having more fun and getting to do more of the dentistry that we really enjoy doing so if you've enjoyed these uh this conversation if it's helping you to uh 
progress and become better in your own practice. We'd like to hear more from you about that. Of course, you can always text us. That's one of the things that's allowed for us to get to really connect with you directly. But we'd also like for you to like, share, and subscribe on both our YouTube and Apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from, Spotify, what have you. Uh, and of course, just sharing this with your friends and colleagues, letting them know who the dental guys are, what we're all about. Uh, that really helps us a lot. And definitely look forward to what's coming for, coming for us in the next few weeks. It's going to be exciting. We're going to be joined by some really uh, awesome people out at Spear Education coming up in the next few weeks as we kind of continue our journey with them. Uh, so don't, uh, uh, even better stuff's coming as we go forward. So for Wes, I'm John. We are the Dental Guys.